How we doing? We doing good? Yeah, come on, girl. All right, so I'm going to be going through a lot of scriptures today. So I thought I would hand you a piece of paper with all the verses I'm going to cover. That way, you, you I mean, they're going to be on the screen and you can open up your Bible. I want that. But that way you kind of know what we've been tracking through and you have it for the rest of your life. Is that cool? Can I hand this out? Yeah. All right. Let me, let me uh, hand these out here. Okay. No, I'm good. All right. Those who are watching online, I was just passing out some papers. All right, if you have one near you, share with a friend. Awesome. Okay. This is why I'm in youth ministry. I love how people came over and said, hey, can I help pass these out? No. I'm good. So... The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all are pointing to Pentecost Sunday. Jesus' ministry, his words, his teaching is pointing to Pentecost Sunday. And the fulfillment of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John is in Acts. It's really cool. And so I want to begin, see all of this this idea of the Holy Spirit making his home in humanity, it begins with Jesus. And so our first passage is in John chapter 1. Look at it with me. Then John, this is John the Baptist, gave this testimony. This is what he said. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. He's talking about Jesus. And I myself, I didn't know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. He's the one who's going to bring God's Spirit to us. Now, here's the thing. It begins with Jesus. The next step in the process of bringing us back to God, bringing God's spirit to us, is we get to become the temple of the Holy Spirit. It starts with Jesus. He is the walking, talk, talking temple where heaven and earth meet, the place where the spirit dwells. And then the next step is we get to partake in this and so it begins with an invitation. In John chapter 7, next passage. On the last day, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Now Jesus would say things like this. He was an amazing communicator. He would say things like, he or she who has ears to hear, let them hear. If you are hungry, if you are longing, if you are thirsty for something greater than yourself, lean in. I have something for you. So this is what he says. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Verse 38. If you're thirsty, come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So he's saying this is going to happen. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit down the road here. A few things have to happen first. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So those who want life as it was intended, as God created it to be, us in communion with his spirit. 
us being the dwelling place of God. Those who are dying for a life worth living, those who are longing for connection, more spirituality, more closeness with God, this is for you. This is what Jesus is saying. Then this is for you. Luke 11, verse 13. We're just tracking this, and we're going to get to Acts in a moment. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give gifts, gifts, good gifts, <laughs> good, give good gifts to your children. Why was that hard to say? How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God wants to give you good things. But the ultimate gift is his spirit. John 14, beginning in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Verse 17, this, this is the spirit of truth. So literally, this is a confusing world. Sometimes it's, ha- it's, it's hard to know what to believe. But a life that is open and being led by the Spirit, the Spirit will lead you in all truth. And he continues, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will, it's going to happen in Acts, will be in you. John 16 verse 7. But very truly, I tell you, are you guys catching this? Are you guys with me? Like literally, the whole thing, Jesus is constantly, constantly going, the Holy Spirit's going to come. I'm going to usher in the Spirit. This is going to be a new age. Like, we're, if you read the Gospels and you don't see what is, what's going to culminate in Acts, you ha- you've, been, you've been missing it. John 16, 7, but very truly, I tell you, it is for your good, now, Check this out. Jesus has died at this point in John chapter 16. He has risen from the dead. And for 40 days, he has taught at least 500 people, most say about 1,000, who have taught, been taught by the resurrected Jesus for over a month. And now he's saying, I'm going to go away. I'm going to ascend into heaven. We heard about this last week. I am going away. And unless I go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus is going, I know you don't want me to leave. And they're like, please, what do you mean go away? Are you kidding me? He's like, literally, it's better to have the Holy Spirit in you than me with you. My spirit is, my spirit in you is better than me physically outside of you. John 14, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. This is going to happen. Jesus is telling them. He will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. This is why we have the scriptures. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Literally, the Holy Spirit The Holy Spirit is like, look at Jesus. Do you see Jesus? This is why you are here. This is why you are fascinated with Jesus. This is why you are like, man, I just can't get over Jesus. I read the Gospels, and dude, I just love Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit in you going, Jesus, do you see Jesus? Like the Holy Spirit can't get over Jesus. Acts 1.8. All right, here we go. Now we're into Acts it's getting ready to happen. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus now goes, okay, this is going to happen. You are going to become the dwelling place of God the walking, talking temple where his spirit lives. And we turn the page to Acts chapter 2, and it is the fulfillment of all of these verses that we've just read throughout the Gospels and the fulfillment of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Do you want to read the fulfillment? Yes, you do. Let's do it. 
Acts chapter 2. Is this boring you? Okay. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So they're waiting. The Holy Spirit comes, and it's amazing. Other things happen, but one of the things that happens is they start speaking in a language they've never been taught. We know, let me just pause there, that's, that's a weird thing. That's a weird, that's a weird thing. Let's just call it what it is. Weird. So we know that about 120 people are in an upper room waiting and praying and seeking God because of what Jesus said would happen in 1-8, Acts 1-8. So there they are waiting for the promise of the Spirit to come, and it all happens on the day of Pentecost, and this is no mistake. Historically, Pentecost was the day in the Jewish calendar to celebrate the start of the harvest, but more importantly, this was the very day that God presented the law to Moses. This is the very day in the Old Testament that God writes with his finger on stone tablets the Ten Commandments. They're up on a mountain, and Moses comes walking down. This is the very day that God gives his law to his people, now he's given his spirit. So the spirit of God is given, is poured out on these disciples, and amazing things happen. I don't know if anyone has ever prayed for you, and you felt the power and presence of God, that's his spirit. Or maybe someone has prayed for you, and all of a sudden you're like, man, I feel so much peace. That's the Holy Spirit. Maybe you have been struggling with overwhelming anxiety and you pray and somehow you feel joy. That's the Holy Spirit. Maybe someone prayed for you and you started speaking in another language. And someone around you is like, dude, you're speaking my home country's language. And you're like, I am? That's weird. So I'm eight years old. I uh, went to a church uh, when I was young that uh, you would go to church two times on Sunday. How awful. (laughs) Two times? Some of you are like, twice a month is good. (laughs) Two times in one day? Are you insane? Football's on. I know, it was torture for a little boy like me. So we go back, we go Sunday morning, we go back Sunday night, and the thing about that Sunday night service, the, the, the pastor and his wife and all the ministers said, we want you to come tonight and we want you to bring your children, your little ones, your babies, your elementary school kids, your teenagers, bring all the kids because we're going to have a special night where we're going to pray for the children. So we show up kind of expectant. I'm eight years old. At this point, eight-year-olds, we're not really even, especially eight-year-old boys, we're not really human yet. (laughs) All kinds of brain damage. You know, dried snot here on the, it's just not quite human yet. Here's what I remember. The pastor's wife, I'll never forget her name, Eunice. I know. It's a weird name. If you're a Eunice here today, welcome. <laughs> All right. This, the pastor's wife comes, places her hands on me. Now, she obviously had done the work. Like, she for days because I know how this works as a pastor. She, for days, probably fasted and prayed 
and did the work to come ready to pray for little kids. Because when, as soon as she put her hand on me, I felt electricity shoot from the top of my head through my body to the bottoms of the soles of my feet and just reverberated. And I could barely stand. I'm eight years old. I'm a second grade boy. And I just start weeping. And something weird happens. I all of a sudden start speaking in a language I didn't know. I just start speaking this language. This is what I remember. A lady with dark skin came running over. And she said, that little boy is speaking the language from my country. And he's declaring the, how glorious God is. He's declaring the good news of Jesus. I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know what was going on. All I knew was I had never felt such peace and connection and spirituality. I had never felt such fulfillment in my life. So something amazing happens in this upper room. They are filled with the Spirit of God, and they begin speaking in languages they've never been taught. They've never spoken before. Now, because a Jewish festival is happening, there are thousands of people outside. Most experts think the upper room was near the temple, in the temple courtyard, so there are literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that can, like, fit there. These 120 in the upper room go outside. They see all the thousands of people, and Peter shares with all these thousands of people what was going on, what the noise is all about, and 3,000 right away believe in Jesus, and they immediately are indwelt by the Spirit of God. 3,000. So the sequence is this. Jesus lives this amazing life. He, we kill him. He raises from the dead. He teaches for 40 days about up to upwards to 1,000 people. He ascends into heaven. He is king. He has all authority. And then he tells them, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the Spirit to come they head back. There they are like, dude, let's get back to Jerusalem like Jesus said. Like, I bet they're thinking, as soon as we get to Jerusalem, dude, the Holy Spirit is going to come. Oh my gosh. And they're running back to Jerusalem. And I bet they got back to Jerusalem. They went into that upper room and they had the best prayer meeting they've ever had in their entire lives. But nothing happens. Nothing. Nothing. They're like, Jesus, you ascended into heaven, and you said you would send your Holy Spirit, so send him, Lord. Nothing. And they come back the next day, and the day after that. And for 10 days, they are praying and seeking and running after this. And the cool thing is, is they, they won't give up. We're not... I'll, st the rest of my, I'll be here the rest of my life. I don't care. I know what Jesus said. They keep seeking God. They keep after it. So I was in seventh grade, a few years after second grade. I'm down front at the altar. A different person puts his hands on my head. I haven't spoken in another language since second grade. That was a one-off. Man prays for me, seventh grade. I start speaking in that language again. And again, it was like <laughs> power. I don't know what I'm saying. And uh, this pastor takes his microphone and he puts it in my, in, right in my mouth. So now the whole church can hear what I'm saying. And I was, I think it sounded like, Mama say, Mama say, Mama say, Mama Mama say, Mama say, Mama say, Mama say, Mama say, Mama say, No, it wasn't that. <laughs> that was just, that just came, that's not in my notes. That just, that just came, came out. <laughs> he 
He takes his microphone. I'm a seventh grade boy. Insecurity. I don't want my voice on the PA system. Immediately, I hear my voice, and I stop. And he goes, come on, boy, keep going. Don't call me boy. That's weird. And I was like, no. And I literally went, I'm never doing that again. And through middle school and high school, I started to see things that, like the manipulation of people, the glorification of that particular gift over other gifts. And I was like, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want it. I go into ministry, and I'm a Trinitarian. That means I am into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Scriptures. I go to a seminary that teach, teaches me that we don't need the Holy Spirit anymore because we have the gift of, of, of God's word. And I buy it. I buy it. I go into ministry and I see massive awesomeness. I mean thousands of kids coming to Jesus. And we do that without, the Holy Spirit was doing it but without me acknowledging that the Holy Spirit was working. And um, I get to my 30s, and culture is shifting. Post-Christianity is emerging. The things that used to work in youth ministry are no longer nearly as effective. I have found that my soul is dry, living a life disconnected from God's Spirit, resistant to His Spirit. So I'm in my 30s, my youth group is struggling. They are uh, not open to Jesus at all. I am dry in my soul, and so every morning I start going, well, all right. God, it'd kind of be cool if you would fill me with your spirit again because I'm dying. And if you want me to speak that language, again, I'll, I'm, I'll be open to it. And I was like, but you can't do anything weird. <laughs> Every morning, God, I'd love to, if you want to do this, I'd love it. I prayed that prayer every morning for a year. It says in this passage, 10 days, these guys just stay after it. They're praying, seeking, praying, seeking. They're not giving up. For me, every morning, I put my two feet on the ground and go, God, if today's the day, I'm open. A year goes by of me praying this prayer every single day, and I find myself in London, England. I'm in the balcony of a church. We're just singing worship songs. No one touches me. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just invades me. And really what it is, the Holy Spirit was already living in me, just filled me up. And I started speaking in that language again. I go back home to these kids who are resistant to Jesus, and I tell them about the Holy Spirit. And they're like, yeah, we can be into the Spirit. Just don't talk about Jesus anymore. Now, here's the cool thing, and we already read this. The Holy Spirit points people to Jesus. So I start telling them about the Holy Spirit, and God stop, starts working, and then all of a sudden, they're way into Jesus. It kind of worked reverse of what, how I thought it would, but this is, this is what happens. The Holy Spirit gets us to Jesus. One day, we're praying for kids. We don't even tell them about tongues. At that point, I'm not even really comfortable talking about it even though I am doing it now every day at this point, by myself, in my prayer closet. All of a sudden, we're praying for these kids, and we've never taught them anything. They start speaking in other languages. It happens to them. Their friends next to them take their phones out and go to Google Translate 
and they start recording what these kids are saying and speaking a language they've never spoken before. And they found out some of, our, some of these kids were speaking ancient Latin, had never studied Latin, and they were declaring the wonders of God in ancient Latin. And I was like, dude, that is sick. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to record myself so I know what the heck I'm saying. So I get home. I set my phone down. Google Translator, record. Nothing. Like, mm, pause. All right. Now I start speaking in tongues. Okay, got it. Record. Nothing. I try this four or five times, and I just realize, okay, I guess you don't want me to know what the heck I'm saying, but one day I will be standing before God, and he will, he will look at me, and he'll say, Brock, well done, well done. He will look at me and say, man, you have given your life, your life to every new generation for your entire career. You've given your life away to kids. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then he will look at me and he, he will go, you want to know what you've been saying? <laughs> and I'm going to say yes. And he will go, Mama, say, Mama, Mama, stop, you stop. Okay. Josh, I love you. <laughs> so these 120 disciples keep after it. They're not going to relent. They keep waiting on the Holy Spirit to come and indwell them. And on the 10th day, when the day of Pentecost has fully come, boom, the Spirit arrives. Now, it's super important. I want you to understand this briefly. The Holy Spirit is not a power, but a person. The Holy Spirit is not a power to be, be manipulated. The Holy Spirit is a person who moves according to the wisdom and the purposes of God. So they are there in one place, sharing the same heart, leaning in and waiting and praying for God to send His Spirit. They are determined and they stay after it. Acts chapter 2, verse 2, look at it again with me. Suddenly it a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. It says, suddenly, the Holy Spirit came unexpectedly. Can something come suddenly after 10 days? I don't know, but that's exactly how it was. They were praying and praying for 10 days, and when the Spirit came, it caught everyone by surprise. It says then that they hear the sound of wind. Of course they did. Did you know that the word wind and Holy Spirit are the same word? The same word. Spirit and wind are the same word in Hebrew, in Greek, in Aramaic, and in Latin. Same word. So God sends the Spirit, and when it happens, they hear the sound of wind, and it's the Spirit. Not wind, just the sound of wind. It's the sound of the Spirit being poured out onto his disciples. Now, verse 3. Check out verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So something like fire, but not actually fire. The closest thing they can think of is like, oh, it's kind of like fire. It's fire, but not fire. Now, the idea of fire in the scriptures is purification. The refiner's fire. The Holy Spirit enters this vessel and refines, forms, shapes, bringing all and leaving only that which will last. And I think this is an important point. The filling of the Holy Spirit is not just about for power, but for refining and purifying. So God is indwelling them and doing his work in them, and they begin speaking in other languages. Now, when the Spirit does a work in you, gang, it's never just for you. 
So let's keep reading. Acts chapter 2, we're going to skip to verse 5. Verse 5. Now, there were, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. It's not just for them, it's for others. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, which sounds like a disease you don't want, Pamphylia, <laughs> Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, even Arabs are there. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, in our own languages, amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, some, however made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem. Let me ex let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose, dude. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of the prophet. Joel, hundreds of years before this. Verse 17, in the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit out on everybody, on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, even eight-year-old little boys. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And the amazing thing is that for these people, this becomes lifestyle for them. And everyone gets in on it. The young and the old, men and women, Jew and not Jew. This is for everyone. And they are now daily going back and allowing the Spirit to empower them. This is not a one-off. Check out Ephesians with me, the next verse on your list, Ephesians 5.18. Paul, years later after this, many years later after this, Paul, in Ephes he's writing the Ephesian church, says in verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. You can, you can substitute that with anything. What is it when the heat is on, when the pressure is on, when anxiety comes, what do you go to that is leading you into darker and darker places? He's like, don't do that. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Wait, seek, fill me. The verb be filled is famously a present tense verb, which means do it regularly, continually. Some versions translate it daily, daily be filled. It's also an imperative verb, which means this is a command, not a suggestion. Continuously be tuned in with God's spirit and allow him to give you rest, to give you peace, to fill you your heart with love, not anger towards the people around you. You walk into places, be filled, continuously be empowered by God's spirit so that you can be light in dark places, so that you can resist the devil and he will flee. Be filled with the spirit. It's non-negotiable. And do it nonstop. God wants you to live a life in tune with him by the empowerment of his spirit. Living a life where you know and understand God's heart in certain situations. That can be difficult. In his book, Chasing Daylight, Erwin McManus writes this. Check it out. Whenever we seize divine moments and the Holy Spirit's empowerment, we magnify the presence of God. To act on God's behalf is to express what's on his mind and on his heart. When we do this, we become a flagship of God's activity. 
and the contemporary equivalent of the pagans who called the followers of Christ Christians because they looked like Jesus. They moved in divine rhythm. To watch a follower of Christ live was to see God move. Now, they weren't carbon copies of Jesus, but dynamic expressions of his character. And when things got tough, the image of Christ in them became clear. No matter how dark darkness is, it is never thick enough to snuff out the light. The moment you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit makes his dwelling in you. Literally, you're like, I'm in. The moment. His spirit comes and begins to work from the inside out. It's kind of like some of you are really rich, so you have electric fireplaces, you rich people. You, you go to the fireplace and you look under those pretend fake logs, and there's a pilot light that's always on. You have a pilot light inside of you. The Holy Spirit is always on, always. As soon as you say yes to Jesus, there it is, pilot light. Now, what's really amazing is you can go over to that switch in a dark room, in a cold place. You just flip that switch. That light has always been burning, but it consumes the fireplace. It overwhelms the fireplace. It brings light to the room and warmth in the coldness. This is saying daily flip that switch. The Holy Spirit's already in you. Once you say yes to Jesus, there. But some of you have left that switch in the off position for far too long like I did. And your soul is starving, is struggling, is dry. Your heart is hard and your prayers are cold. We daily seek God to enable us to live this connected life to the divine. So how this works out in my life. Sometimes I will have a hard day, a few meetings, difficult things. I will feel stressed, and I'll be heading home, and I'll know, dude, I am in a grouchy mood. I am irritable. And I know looking at you, looking at me, you would be like, oh, please, Brock, you're always so wonderful. So I will pull the car over before getting home on the side of the road. And I'll just go, I got to go home and I'm going to serve my wife. I don't want to serve my wife. I'm going to love my daughter. I don't, well, I, I, I do love my daughter. But I am just, I just want to go check out. I just want to go home and veg out. I don't want to contribute. I don't want to hear about their day. So Holy Spirit, empower me. Sometimes I'll sit there for 20 minutes because I'm that hard-hearted. It takes me about 20 minutes and all of a sudden I will start to feel the warmth inside of me grow. All right, I'm ready. And I drive the rest of the way home. I walk into that house and I love my family well. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Holy Spirit. Empower me. And a life that is empowered by the Spirit with the light switch continually, daily, in an ongoing way, being flipped to the on position, that life exudes the fragrance of heaven, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, forbearance. That word means tolerance and self-control, a life that flips that switch on, on the regular, is a life that is self-controlled, yeah, things you haven't been able to overcome your entire life, dude, that switch has been off for far too long, flip it on. Paul says, last verse on your sheet of paper, 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and we don't have this one for the screen, says this, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? Don't you know that you're the dwelling place of God? Like, don't you know this? Have you forgotten who you are? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. How do you honor God with your body? Do you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and empower you to live the life you were created to live? So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to invite the uh, band up. Um, I want to lead you through... Uh, a prayer, simple prayer. And I don't want you to be afraid. Some of you are like, God knows what you need. And some of you are desperate for God's peace right now. And so he's going to give you peace. Some of you are desperate to just allow him to minister to you by his spirit. And he wants to do that. And what I want to do is just kind of lead you through a prayer. And so if you're comfortable, will you, will you stand with me? And put, get your hands free. Put things down on your chair. If you're comfortable, if you want to, maybe you can close your eyes and open your hands. Just say, God, I'm open to you. And under your breath, this is what I want you to pray. I'm going to give you some words. God, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me. Like, you know what I've done. I'm even at times ashamed to say it so God just forgive me please forgive me it has led me to more and more heartache forgive me of my lust and my anger forgive me of wasted time God forgive me thank you I just say thank you for your forgiveness thank you Jesus thank you I want you to say, Jesus, come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Come into my life and lead me. You lead, I'll follow. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Take a deep breath. Exhale. Jesus. Now, Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me with your presence. Jesus. Jesus, fill me with your spirit. The followers of Jesus prayed this prayer for 10 days. 10 days. We can do couple minutes. So fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Work in my heart. Give me peace. Some of you might be feeling tingling in your hands. I'm feeling tingling in my hands. Sometimes God does physical sensations to make us aware of him. Some of you might just feel nothing and that is what I feel most of the time that's completely normal others of you might be feeling a sense of like emotion go back in Holy Spirit fill me empower me strengthen me Holy Spirit strengthen me
more. There could be different sensations you're feeling. Just this is the Holy Spirit working. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Keep the pedal down. Stay engaged. Holy Spirit. prayer team is up front prayer team it could be something for you to pray just that when people come up that the Holy Spirit would fill them you just pray that prayer you could have some specifics you want to pray for do that too but prayer team I want you to pray sometimes the laying on of hands God fill this person right now with your spirit again it doesn't have to be weird. It could be natural, supernatural. We don't have to drum anything up. The Aaron is going to lead us. The band is going to lead us. And let's just stay engaged in worship.